Good morning. Everybody doing good? Good. So I, I do want to uh, tell you to turn to Romans chapter 11. And while you're, while you're doing that, I want to personally invite you to come to Turkey. So when you hear like Pastor Brian's doing a turkey tour, it sounds like Thanksgiving or something uh, crazy like that. So I wanted to explain just a little bit. Um, if you're new, uh, for a long time, since 2006, I've been doing discipleship experiences in the lands of the Bible to really help people understand the biblical text in context so they can see the pictures of the biblical text with their own eyes. And it changes, it changes you. It changes your uh, approach to the biblical text. It changes your, how, how it comes out in your daily life. If you teach, it changes how you teach. Uh, Turkey is biblical Asia Minor. And so uh, if you think of the New Testament, everything past the Gospels all the way to Revelation, Turkey's all in there. Um, And so when you walk the land in Turkey and you look at the archaeology, we're looking at two layers, 45 AD is the time of Paul and Paul's missionary journeys. Layers is like layers of archaeology. And then uh, 90 AD, which is uh, the seven churches of Revelation and John's letter to the church of Revelation, is profound because it shows you how these disciples uh, of Jesus from Nowheresville in Israel took the gospel to the mighty Roman Empire. And the lessons for taking the gospel to the mighty American Empire are much the same. And, uh, and so I just want to invite you. Uh, we're not eating turkey there at all. It's just, uh, just not that. Uh, but it is, it is a profound adventure, and I uh, hope that you can come. Uh, so we're in Romans chapter 11 this morning. We're going to read Romans 11, 11 to 24, but really we'll look at the entire chapter. I'm going to ask you to stand with me uh, as we read this section of Scripture if you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words at the end of the main text reading, just to distinguish God's word from my own. <clears throat> so here's what the scripture says, beginning of verse 11 of chapter 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, What will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so the whole lump, uh, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, Remember, it is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. This is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you are cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree... How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? You may be seated. That makes perfect sense, right? (laughs) 
<clears throat> Romans chapter 11 is really complex uh, because it uses metaphors that aren't uh, intuitive to us as uh, 21st century Western Christians. And Paul is making a very bold statement. Now, you may remember, and if you've been here for any length of time, that <clears throat> we have been walking slowly through the book of Romans. And Romans is a letter. It's like if I wrote a letter to you, it's expected that you would read all of it, not just in pieces and parts. And so here, we're looking at just a small part of a larger letter. And Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 are very doctrinally profound. They deal with weighty issues like the sovereignty of God, the free will of men and women, and salvation, and how it works. It deals today specifically with Israel and what happens to Israel in light of the rejection of Israel toward Jesus, and what are we supposed to think about it as Gentiles? So every time I use the word Gentile, I'll never forget, my, my kid asked me one time when she was very small if a Gentile was a lot like a crocodile. And I said, no, uh, it's not. And so I want to make sure you know what a Gentile is. So a Gentile is anyone from any other uh, heritage besides a Jewish heritage. So unless you were uh, born from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are Gentile. It just means the people groups, the nations, right? So raise your hand if you're a Gentile, right? To my friend over here, Herschel, he's Jewish. Raise your hand if you're Jewish. One dude, one guy. But I'm glad Herschel's here. He's my friend. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, Anyway, so the, the bottom line is that 99.9% .9 of you in here are Gentile. And what Paul is doing here in, in, in showing us this incredible doctrine is also uh, giving the Gentiles in the Roman church what my dad used to call a talking to. Like, you need a talking to here. Because they have become arrogant toward the Jewish people. And I'm just thinking about this for just a minute. Like, where does this arrogance come from? So these Roman, that, that church that's receiving this letter, it's made up of Jewish background believers and Roman background believers. So the Roman background believers, like sometime in their life, were absolutely worshiping Caesar, uh, were a absolutely worshiping Zeus, uh, Aphrodite, Artemis. You think of the Pantheon, they were worshiping all of them, and all of that comes with horrible, crazy things that don't fit uh, with the way of living that Jesus teaches. And so they have now left that behind, and they've, because of Jesus, they've confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead. They've been saved, and they've come into the church, and there are these Jewish background believers in the church. And these guys, Jewish background believers, grew up with the Torah, keeping the Sabbath, eating all the kosher, uh, law, according to all the kosher dietary laws, practicing a biblical sexual ethic. Uh, they have worked very hard to be Jewish in some ways. <clears throat> and so, but the Jews notably have, not these that are in the church, but notably the Jews at large have rejected Jesus as the Messiah, as the fulfillment of the Torah. And so I think what's happening is these Romans who have come to Christ are now like, kind of like we are when I take a group to Israel for the first time, like they spend eight days in, uh, they spend eight hours in the land the first day. Sun up to sundown, the text. And at the end of the day, inevitably, someone will say, how did the Jews not get it? And I'm always like, you've been in the land eight hours, and you're asking this question. It's a good question. Let's talk about it. The Romans are doing the same thing in that church. How do they not get it? If I had seen the parting of the Red Sea, if I had seen the tabernacle, if I had seen the two tablets, the ark, of all that stuff... Mir oh, it, I, 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 why don't they see Jesus as the fulfillment of the law? Because it's, it's so obvious, right? And this is what we dive into uh, today. So I'm going to make four observations, um, <clears throat> and maybe two if my voice stops before then. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, but I want to make four observations. The first is this. Is this it just begins with uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Paul is asking the question out loud, has God rejected Israel? Has he rejected Israel? Verse one, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Uh, by no means. So what does Paul think the answer is? No. 
For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's given you in short form his credentials, his card as a, as a card-carrying Israelite, a card-carrying Jew, like he is a Jew of Jews. He's saying, I am them, and he cares a lot about them. He said it in Romans 9 and Romans 10, and now he's going to say it again in Romans 11. No, God hasn't rejected Israel. Now, before we get into this, I think we have to answer the question, who is Israel? Who is Israel? So uh, today, when we look at Israel, uh, 2023, it said that 9.8 million people lived in the state of Israel, right? That's made up of not just Jews. There are Jews, a lot of Jews in Israel, and all kinds of different kinds of Jews, Orthodox Jews, religious Jews, secular Jews, all kinds of Jews. But there are also Arab Israeli Muslims in Israel. Uh, there are Arab Israeli Orthodox Christians in Israel. The, the evangelical population of Israel today is less than 2% of the entire population. Evangelical meaning people that have uh, confessed with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead, and are walking according to, uh, to the scriptures as a disciple of Jesus. This is a very small percentage. So... Is, are we talking about that 9.8 million people? Is that what Paul is talking about? What I think he's talking about <clears throat> in, in Romans chapter 11, he is talking about the people who descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and are following Torah. They're following the work of the law. They're trying to live it out and they're living it out with works, and they've rejected Jesus as the fulfillment of that law. So here's what he says. Has God rejected Israel? He says by no means. Look at verse two. He gives an example. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? So the first example he gives about how God hasn't rejected Israel and won't reject Israel is what I'm going to call the Elijah remnant, right? The important word is remnant, remnant. God is always leaving a remnant among the Jewish people. So Paul says, look at the Elijah remnant. There were 7,000 people during the time of Elijah that were a remnant in a time period when most of the Jews were worshiping Baal and Yahweh at the same time. Now, there's a big backstory here. It goes all the way back to 1 Kings. I'll read one verse, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, here's the backstory. Elijah thought he was the only prophet of God left in Israel at that time period. The, the prevailing winds of religion in Israel at that time, though they knew the Torah, though they knew God, though they had the promise, the covenant, and all that, was Baalism. Baalism came because of a marriage that took place uh, between the king of Israel and a lady named Jezebel. And Jezebel is a priestess of Baal. She brings Baalism to the country and she propagates it. Baalism, to make a long story short, is uh, Baal is a, is a, a bull uh, that looks like this. He's got his arms out. He's an idol in many of the towns there. And he's got a, a fire pit in his belly. And you would bring your firstborn to be sacrificed to Baal in the, in the fire pit, Right? Everybody's watching, all of that kind of stuff. His counterpart is Asherah. Asherah is uh, uh, when Baal and Asherah, this is easier in the field and less easy at uh, church. Uh, when Baal and Asherah copulate, they make rain and bring fertility. And so you pray for that and you act it out in Baalism. So do you see what the people of God are doing? Do you hear me without me describing everything? It's kind of like the story last week. Like, do I have to tell you everything? <laughs> no. If you weren't here, you should go back and watch the video. It's pretty funny. But this is Baalism. And so 
Uh, Elijah thought he was the only one left. And so he, he says to the prophets of Baal, meet me on Mount Carmel. We'll build an altar. Uh, we'll call on your God, Baal. And if he answers and rains fire down from heaven, uh, we will know that Baal is God. But if he doesn't, I will call on Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if he answers, rains fire down from heaven, laps up the sacrifice of this altar, we will know he is God. So they gather all the prophets of Baal, all the people gather around on Mount Carmel. They build this altar. They, they place a sacrificed bull on the altar. The prophets of Baal begin to call Baal's name over and over and over for hours. Elijah gets snarky. He's like, you know, is he going to the bathroom? Where is he? Is he it's in the text. I'm not lying to you. Is he uh, asleep? Maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's just traveling. Maybe he's not in today. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Nothing happens. And then Elijah calls on Yahweh, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Fire rains down from heaven. The prophets of Baal flee. There is, a, a, uh, there is carnage as the prophets of Baal are killed. And Elijah flees to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. This is all in First uh, Kings. Uh, he thought he was the only one left, but what 1 Kings 19, 18 tells us is that there was a remnant of faithful people, 7,000 people in that time period, Jewish people who uh, believed had faith and were walking it out. Now, at the end times, we get what I'm going to call an eschatological re remnant. We see it in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14. It just, Revelation is a book written by John off the coast of Turkey. And uh, he, he is there writing as a revelation of Jesus and he writes it to seven churches, seven churches of Jesus Christ in biblical Asia Minor. And he, he unveils what's gonna happen at the end time as revealed by Jesus. And he shows an eschatological remnant of Jewish people. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And it goes on to list 12 tribes, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, an eschatological, an end times remnant of people who are Jewish from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who have placed their faith in Christ. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, that's Jesus, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So that he is showing us not only Elijah, but also an eschatological end times remnant to say, God is always raising up a remnant from the Jewish people, even to the end times, and those rem that remnant, they will be close to to Jesus in the end times because uh, they, have, they have seen him as the fulfillment of all of the law and they've chosen to place their faith in him to believe and to confess he is Lord, to believe he's been raised from the dead and realize they're not getting there by works. But they're getting there by faith. Right, So there's this remnant all through the scripture. Paul is saying, has God rejected Israel? His answer is no, he hasn't. He is saving them uh, through a remnant. The, the, the oddity here is that the elect, meaning people that God chose to, to, to be saved, obtained faith, this remnant, and the rest were hardened. Listen to Romans chapter 11, five to seven. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant. Now, Paul is saying, like, look, during th this moment, which would be the first century at the time of this writing, during this moment, there is a remnant. Paul's saying, I, I am part of the remnant. Every Jewish believer in this church is a part of the remnant in that time, right? So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. So there is an elect, this remnant, that God fulfills his promises to Israel through generation to generation all the way to the end times. He has not forsaken Israel. Secondly, <clears throat> he gives this message to Gentile believers. Like, 
this 11 to 24 turns to the Gentiles in the church uh, because it, it is combating an arrogance toward the Jewish people, right? So you follow history. There's often an arrogance toward the Jewish people. Right? You follow it. You'll see it. But in this moment, among the believers, there is an arrogance that Paul is combating here. He, he, he goes on in these about 12 verses to use a metaphor to show us what has happened. And this is a metaphor an Easterner understands and a Westerner may uh, struggle with. His point is, look, Gentile people, all of you except Herschel. All of you, listen, Gentile people, you have been grafted into something greater than yourselves, and it's no doing of your own. And then it's kind of like, let me explain. Their sin, the rejection of Jesus, their sin, while it is, it is hardened them, has been a blessing to you. Because the, the, the sin of the Jewish people, unbelief, has resulted in your belief. It's how the gospel went from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the, uh, the earth. Listen to what Acts 28, 28 says. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Okay, the, the intimation is that it wasn't being heard. It was being rejected by the Jewish people. Now it's going to the Gentiles because they will listen. Just to bring it home for just a minute, how miraculous is it that Jesus, crucified in the first century, uh, raised again in the first century, ascended to heaven in the first century? This is the 21st century that we live in. Uh, over there, it takes, you know, 16 hours by plane. But way over there, all that happened. How is it that you sit gathered in a building today as the church saying we worship him because we received the gospel that came to the Gentiles? It's miraculous. Uh, there's a lot of grace there, a lot of hope for us to understand. And Paul just begins to give us this message like, look, their unbelief resulted in your belief. So before you get arrogant, hold on a second. He talks about two different kinds of olive trees, a cultivated, cultivated olive tree, which is the Jewish people in this metaphor, and then uh, a wild olive shoot, which is everybody but Herschel in the room, okay? So let me show you a picture. Uh, picture number one is just a cultivated olive vineyard, right? So it's pretty beautiful, huh? Uh, you're thinking like California, somewhere like this, but it's all over the Middle East like, like that. And uh, not all over, but in places. And so <clears throat> the, the cultivated tree is the tree that has been taken care of and nurtured over time for a long period of time. And so it's producing much fruit. Now, the root that Paul talks about, that you've been grafted into the root. We would call that in Texas, we would say that's a stump, right? <laughs> it's the bottom part that goes into the ground, the root. And it's this from which the life comes. And so he says that the people of Israel, the Jewish people, they are a cultivated olive tree. Listen to Romans eleven twenty four. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? There's a lot there. So what do we know? We know the Jewish people are the cultivated olive tree. We know the Gentiles are the wild olive tree or the wild olive shoot. It's not rocket science to figure out how a wild olive shoot comes about. Bird eats from cultivated olive tree, flies away, and then what? There you go. You're tracking with me. And uh, it, it, it lands on the ground, and up soon comes 
a wild olive shoot. This is you, everyone but Herschel. This is you. <clears throat> it says that you have been grafted in contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree. So I want to show you a second picture. <clears throat> this is a picture of olive tree in Nazareth. Now, the thing that you're looking for at, on this particular picture, you see the root, or what we would call in Texas, the stump. You see the branches coming out of that. Those branches have been grafted in, right? Which is a technique used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years there to take wild olive shoots and graft them into a cultivated olive tree so they produce a cultivated olive. Now that's science. Who likes science? Paul is using a science metaphor that they all understood to show that you, the wild olive shoot, can be grafted into the cultivated olive tree. He makes the point over and over again that Jesus is the gardener, that he is the one who does the grafting. If I'm a wild olive shoot, I can't graft myself in to a cultivated olive tree. I need a gardener to graft me in. And you just, if you have time, study the gardener from Eden in Genesis all the way to Revelation in the new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth, all the way through. Just follow the gardener. You're going to find Jesus, okay? He is the gardener. Now, um, <clears throat> what does this mean? This means that this is a great grace for me because I've been, I have been now grafted into this root of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob where all the promises are, all the covenant uh, covenants are. All, everything comes from there. And Paul is just saying, like, look, as I grafted, uh, a wild olive shoot grafted in, don't, don't be arrogant toward them. You have no business being arrogant toward them because if, it was, if you could be grafted in, how much easier would it be from them, for them who are branches torn off from a cultivated olive tree to be grafted in again? It's easier than grafting in you, the wild olive shoot. So don't be arrogant them. And then we get to this, like, um, this question, <laughs> broken branches. Did you, did you see that? Did you read that? Like, okay, so there's some broken branches in here. And it, it basically says, like, Israel has the broken branches. They've been broken off, the branches of Israel, and put over here so that you could be grafted in. If that could happen to them, so the scripture says, be careful because you could also be broken off. And what we want to do in our 21st century Western mindset is to say, oh, if I'm, not, if I'm not working hard enough, I might lose my salvation. And that's not what they're saying. That's not the tone or tenor of this. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 20 and 21. It says, um, that is true. Uh, verse 19, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. Why were the branches broken off? Because they were Jewish? No, because of their unbelief in this metaphor. But you stand fast through faith. So you're not going to be like that, Roman church. You're going to stand fast in your faith. You're not working your way to heaven. You have been saved by grace through faith. Stand fast in your faith is what he's uh, saying so do not become proud, but fear God. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And this is where we have to understand. If, if Israel was broken off for unbelief, then what I'll say is this. A, a counterfeit church can be broken off by its unbelief. The problem is unbelief. And you're like, well, what if I don't believe hard enough? And here's, you remember Romans 9? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul's going, going a step further and saying that saved means that you're engrafted in. You're heir to all the promises, and you're going to bear fruit. John would say 
You know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. It's the same kind of metaphor. You're gonna bear cultivated olive fruit in the world, even though you're not a cultivated olive because you've been grafted in by Jesus, the gardener. Now, this is important to understand. Paul thought it was very important to put right here in the middle that we understand uh, this, that unbelief is the catalyst to, a, uh, to lostness. But the gardener can graft a Jewish branch in, back in. He can graft a Gentile branch in. But don't be arrogant toward the root. Third question that he deals with, will Israel experience salvation? Will they experience salvation? What about the ones that right now, if I took you to the Western Wall, we could, we could go right now. What time is it there? Yep, we could go right now, 7.23 at night. They would be there praying, reciting Torah, wearing tassels, with teflon around their arms in the form of a shin, with a phylactery box with the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, written inside of it. They would be living the letter of the law in front of you in the moment. And they reject Jesus. You would be, most of the time when I take people there, they're, they, they're like, man, I, can, I, I, I wish I was that dedicated. They reject Jesus. And so what, what then of them? What then of the, 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 the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who follow Torah and reject Jesus? Will Israel experience salvation? And Paul uh, deals with this in verses 25 to 32 specifically. Here are some things that we learn. Paul believes this is a mystery that requires revelation from God. It's a mystery. Not like Fred and Velma and the mystery machine. Some of you are tracking. Bill and, did you ever watch Scooby-Doo? I mean, good. Okay, so not exactly like that. It's more like this is, this is the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the kingdom. Like, how can you know the mind of God? No matter how old you are, no matter how much of the Bible you've studied and memorized, like how can you fully know the mind of God? It's a mystery that requires the revelation of God. And arrogance comes in saying God is done with Israel. He's done because of their rejection. That's saying that God won't keep his promises. That can't be right. There is a, a theology called replacement theology. Some people are tempted to embrace it. Replacement theology is, okay, uh, now we're in the era of the church. The era of Israel was back then, and the church has replaced Israel. Well, if I've replaced Israel, why do I have to be grafted in? It makes no sense. It makes linear sense, but God is not linear. He works more like this. And so it's, it's important for us to understand that God is not done with him. It's a mystery. Will Israel experience salvation? Yes, according to the scripture, but not each and every Israelite. Yes, but not each and every Israelite. What do I mean by that? The promises to Israel, all the covenants and promises to Israel that we see in the Old Testament are fulfilled through the grafting in of the Gentiles, through the 144,000 in times Jewish remnant, through the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. Salvation comes to Israel through a Jewish Messiah. There are many in that moment open their eyes to it. They were the first remnant, and the gospel came from them. There are Jews today that open their eyes to Jesus the Messiah. We call them Messianic Jews. They follow Jesus in a beautiful, beautiful way. They're a very small percentage of who's in Israel today. They follow him in a, a beautiful, beautiful way. They are a remnant. There is an, an end times, 144,000 remnant coming. God will keep all his promises through the remnant because of Jesus, but make no mistake, 
all of the Old Testament points to what I'm getting ready to say, and all the prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet gets re- to points ready to what I'm getting ready to say. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That means Gentiles. That means Jews. That's everybody, every, every pop people group on the earth. No one comes to the Father except by me. So yes, yes, Israel will experience salvation, but it will be through the remnant and only through belief and confession in Jesus the Messiah. That's important for us to understand. A third observation in this section is, is, you know, when we talk about experiencing, Israel experiencing salvation, God works even through disobedience to bring about his divine will. Did you know that? I mean, here we see it, Romans 11, 29 to 32. For the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. In other words, I'm not, he's not gonna uh, revoke his promises. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God. Was anybody in here at one time disobedient to God? But now have received mercy because of their disobedience. Me being grafted in is mercy. I do not deserve that. Couldn't have done it for myself. It's have received mercy because of their disobedience. That's the Jewish rejection of Jesus, their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. In other words, if God can save you, a Gentile who is disobedient by his mercy, can he not also save a Jew who is disobedient by his mercy? Yes, he will. And in this way, Israel's, the promises to Israel will all be fulfilled. The scholar, commentator, Leon Morris, he said, Paul is emphasizing the divine plan Though Israel had been faithless and thus the object of God's hostility, God had nevertheless worked through this faithfulness, faithlessness to bring about his will. In other words, he didn't need him to do it right or do it wrong. He was going to have his will anyway. And that tells you about the sovereignty of God. And he had not forgotten that Israel was his people. He He doesn't forget his promises or his people. Their refusal to accept the gospel did not alter the fact that he had chosen them to be in a special relationship to him, the people whom he would make his revelation and to whom he would send his son. Jesus was born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph. He is from the tribe of Judah. He grew up in Nazareth. In Hebrew, that's Netzer Eth. It's interesting that you're a wild olive shoot and Netzer is the word for olive shoot, and he grew up in Netzereth, Shootsville. There's not a more beautiful picture. The one who grafts the wild olive shoots in was born in Shootsville. Not born, lived in Shootsville, raised in Shootsville. There's a lot there, but it's, it's awesome. So will Israel experience salvation? yes through the remnant, by the grace of God, through the confession and belief of Jesus Christ as Lord. <clears throat> last, last statement, we're done. Romans eleven thirty two to 36. This section, just Paul brings it, brings it back and says, that, like, this is where the, the rubber meets the road here. No doubt the guy that was worshiping Zeus like two days ago that's sitting listening to this, 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 uh, this letter is like, huh? Just like some of you are like, what is all that? And he's saying like, okay, all all of our questions aren't answered here. They're not all answered here. Um, But we can trust God in his sovereignty according to his plans to keep his promises because of his great mercy. And here's the thing, like in my world, like this chapter makes people go nuts in every way, like predestination, chosen people, in times, what's going to happen, what's political Israel, what's biblical Israel, is it the same thing, is it different? It makes people go 
bonkers. And, and so, and me too, in some ways. And so, he, he, here's what, I, what I, I echo, that what, what Paul has to say here is like, all of our questions aren't answered, but here's the thing. To God, be the glory. <laughs> because who could know, who could know his mind? I mean, if you, if you look at this, just in closing, verse 32, for God has consigned all, all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable is his ways. You cannot criticize his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Any of you? Or who has been his counselor? Has God called you to counsel him? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Have you ever given enough where he was like, oh, yeah, that's enough. It's repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So be it. Let him handle it. Sometimes people get wrapped up in the end times. It's fun to think about. It's going to happen. We know this. There's just a lot we don't know. And people want to talk, talk, talk. And I'm always like, here's what I know. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. That, that there will be an end. The gospel will be preached to all the nations. Then the end will come. There will be a remnant of Israel that will come to him. This is what I know. And then that there will be a day where there's no more tears, no more crying, no more pain anymore. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars like we're living in now. But then the end will come. And it will be to the glory of God and for the good of people. So I'm, I'm good. If I die or he comes back, I'm just going to trust him. To him be the glory. In other words, you take my hands, my feet today, use them for your glory. My mouth, use it for, for your glory. My heart, be, use it for your glory. My, my mind, use it for your glory. I'm not going to stress over what you're in charge of. Because you're the sovereign holy one. Peter said this, remember the denier Peter? Like, if you, he denied Jesus right after he was arrested. He was his beloved disciple. First Peter chapter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's a promise. I'm gonna mess with you the next six weeks because Romans chapter 12 through 16, it gets really practical. It's been a lot of doctrine and it turns really practical. Like next week, I urge you, therefore, brothers, to be living sacrifices living sacrifice in your whole life. Crawl up on the altar, right? We're gonna start walking this stuff out in the next couple of weeks. But right now, what you need to know, God is sovereign over all of it, even Israel. And he hasn't forgotten. He hasn't forgotten you. He will keep his promises. And the grace is, like, I've been grafted into that. It's beautiful. It's a mouthful. It's a lot. 13 minutes late. Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, we bless your name because you are uh, like no other. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's none like you. Who are we to think we can understand everything about you? And so thank you for the revelation that you gave us through the, the biblical word. Thanks for this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome, inspired by your Holy Spirit. I pray, would you help us to, 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 to hear, governed by that same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write it. God, help us to relax in you, in this way. God, give us peace knowing that you've got everything that we don't know or understand handled. You're sovereign over all of it. We have been grafted in 
And that means the promises and the inheritance. And yes, we were wild olive shoots, but you have somehow grafted us in and you're bearing cultivated olives through us. And we say thank you. Thank you. God, I pray for anyone who may need to be grafted in, who's far from you, who, who knows they, they sin and are in need of salvation, I pray. Would you by your spirit, just, just by your kindness and your mercy, lead them to repentance and belief in Jesus that they too might be grafted in, saved. Father, help us to keep this Romans 11 outlook, both as we think about the Jewish people, but also as we think about our own lives and the gift that you've given us in Christ. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.